Well, I must say that I experienced my own bit of wondering this morning as I、uh, did my best in attempting to sub for the bells. <laughs> And if there's nothing that quite reminds you that you can't go through life alone, it is playing in a bell choir. <laughs> And I must say that my rock this morning was joy. I don't even know where Joy is. She, so thank you, Joy, for being the rock which held me up during the offertory piece. <laughs> well, as you know, we are continuing our Lenten series, wandering hearts, figuring out faith with Peter, and we are looking at these stories of Scripture, these well-known stories, through the eyes of Peter. A regular guy, just like us, doing his best to figure it out one day at a time. Our story this morning picks up right where we left off last week. And to refresh your memory, in case you weren't with us or you've slept since then, last Sunday Jesus asked Peter, "Who do you say that I am?" And Peter responds, "You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." It's in that moment that Jesus gives Simon his nickname, Peter, as Alvaro said, as we've been calling him, Rocky, because Peter means rock, and he will be the rock that Jesus builds his church upon. That's what he told him. And in this naming, he Jesus is also calling Peter his rock, that steady, dependable friend that you can count on in good times and bad times, and in the difficult season ahead. Can you think of that person in your life? Your rock. Peter really had a mountaintop experience. His closest friend, his Messiah, the one that he had been waiting for, that his people had been waiting for, his Lord. They are embarking on a mission together to overturn the oppressive system of the Roman Empire, the system. That pushed people down and told people that they were less than just because of who they are, just because of who they were born as. Peter and Jesus are working for the liberation of not just their people, but everyone who had been enslaved. They were going to change things. Can you imagine waking up each morning, not knowing what the day would hold, knowing that it wouldn't be easy, but trusting that you are part of something bigger, part of something that people said couldn't be done, part of something sacred and holy. And transformative and life-changing, life-giving. Can you imagine working alongside your best friend, your most trusted companion, and in, in doing that? And then, just when you start to see that arc of the moral universe bend towards justice. Your friend shares with you the horrible news that he will suffer greatly and be killed. Talk about emotional whiplash from the best news to the worst news. How would you respond? With anger, tears, silence, shock? It's hard to know just how we would react until we are in that moment. 
This is another story that over the years, Peter has been betrayed less than favorably for rebuking Jesus. But I see this as a moment, a real moment, raw, a reaction, a plea, a prayer. Please, no, say it can't be so. Say it isn't true. Don't let this happen. Can't you stop it? Aren't you the Messiah? Is it any wonder that, that Peter took Jesus aside and begged him, God forbid it. And then, it's almost as if Jesus kicks Peter when he's down. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. From his rock to this stumbling block. Think about the people that you love most in your life. Can you think of them? Can you picture them? The people that you are willing to do anything for, you don't want to cause them to stumble. Like a bird leaving the nest, you want them to fly, right? And I bet that you are willing to do anything to help make that happen, just like Peter was. When our midweek Lenten reflection group gathered this Wednesday and talked about our scripture this morning, you might not be surprised that someone said, um, excuse me, Jessica, can you repeat that line again? Sure. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. Did Jesus just call Peter Satan? Yes, he did. But in this context, Satan means tempter. Jesus is saying, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me to not do what I know needs to happen. Don't tempt me with the thoughts of staying here, with my family, with my friends. Don't tempt me. My heart aches for Peter and for Jesus in this moment. The roller coaster of emotions that he must be going through. But he doesn't walk away from this difficult conversation. And neither does Jesus. Jesus knows that he must continue his work in Jerusalem. And he knows what will happen if he does. Maybe this is the first time that Peter has stopped to think about what that actually means. This story tells a deep bond. It shows of a deep bond between Jesus and Peter, his closest disciple begging him to stay, begging him as God enfleshed his Messiah to change the sequence of events. I mean, you fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. You walk on water. Certainly you can change this. But I wonder if, if Jesus didn't want to talk about his suffering and death anymore. Did Peter touch a nerve, a deep fear within Jesus? Did he speak to his humanity? Did he push a button that only the people we are closest to know how? Or better said, we allow. I want to pause and address the fact that even though Jesus knew what would happen if they went to Jerusalem, I don't believe that's why God sent Jesus to live and to breathe and to love among us. God didn't condemn Jesus to death. 
the Roman Empire did. The people in positions of power did. Up until his very last breath, Jesus was teaching and leading and inviting and fighting nonviolently for a different way of being in this world. Even from his very first breath, Jesus' mere existence was a threat to King Herod to those in power, to the point where, if you remember, Herod was willing to murder all the children under two years of age around Bethlehem to assure that this anointed one would not replace him someday. That is what Jesus and Peter and the disciples were up against. We have watched what happens to people who stand up for something different. Oscar Romero, Martin Luther King Jr., Alexei Novani. What do you think Peter expected and hoped for? How would you expect Jesus to behave? How would your Messiah Go up against your oppressors. David Luce writes that the common assumption is that when Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah, he had in mind a warrior king like David, one who would drive out the Romans and liberate the Israelites. A warrior king. When you stop to think about it, that's a pretty understandable, a reasonable hope, right? The Romans were foreign occupiers, not only imposing Roman law, but taxing people to support their occupation and backing up their occupation, order, and taxation by violence. The problem with Peter's expectation isn't that it's not a reasonable one to have, but that it doesn't change anything. Rome is there in force and by violence. Jesus, as a warrior king, uses greater force and violence to drive them out. And then eventually, someone with even more force and violence steps in and is willing to do greater violence yet again and takes over. Who's in charge may change, but the wheel of force, of violence, of oppression, it just keeps going and going and going. Jesus is teaching and telling and showing Peter and the disciples and those that are following him that there is another way, a way that prioritizes justice, a way that promotes neighbor love, a way that is revolutionary, and Peter is all in. But this type of change involves risk. It involves loss. We know that we can't do the same things over and over and over again and expect different results, right? Some have said that that is the definition of insanity. Yet it is so easy it's so natural to cling tightly to what we know. And that isn't always a bad thing. I mean, when I find my world crashing down around me, I cling to what I know. I cling to the people I know. I cling to my favorite restaurants that have the comfort food that I know and love. I cling as hard as I can to what I think I can control. But 
But sometimes when we cling to something so tightly, it breaks. We break. When we cling to something so tightly, it doesn't allow us to open ourselves up to what can be. In the midst of our grief and our hardships, how can we stay rooted in our convictions, holding close the things that ground us, holding close to those core beliefs, those core people that help us move on or get from day to day or even breath to breath, while also loosening our grip of control. Being in relationship, being part of God's beloved community, dropping our nets and following Jesus means letting go to what we're holding tightly to. It means letting go of the things that we are clinging to and reaching out to grab that outstretched hand of what can be. Amen.